we have a lot of legal and compliance. So many things in my job where it's like, God, you can you can paralyze yourself with, oh, are we going to get in trouble? But then I apply the simple lens of, is it the right thing to do? And that usually solves all problems. Top leaders, meaningful conversation, actionable advice, bulldoze complacency, ignite inspiration, create impact. Produced by Southwestern family of companies. This is the Action Catalyst. Welcome Action Catalyst listeners. Today we have Jim Bartolomea as our guest. Jim has worked at some of the biggest tech companies in California, including Qualcomm, ServiceNow, and currently Jim is SVP and Global Head of People and places at ClickUp, the one productivity app to replace them all, leading all aspects of human resources for the software company. Jim, welcome to the show. Adam, how are you? I'm doing well. Where are you uh, zooming in from? Uh, San Diego, California. Did you uh, grow up in San Diego or did you relocate there? Uh, relocated, but funny enough, all my siblings, I'm the youngest of four, all my siblings were born here. My father was a Marine Corps colonel, so he was stationed out in San Diego at the time. Yeah. So I had roots here. And uh, in fact, when I graduated college, uh, both my sister and my brother lived out here and but where did you grow up then, if not in San Diego? Uh, Virginia and Pennsylvania. Virginia Beach, which again, actually, we were in D.C. first because he was at the Pentagon, and then Virginia Beach is a, a huge, you know, Norfolk's a big military town, so kind of, you know, wherever wherever the the Marine Corps takes you is is what you live by. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then actually, his final stop was really interestingly um, was to run the ROTC at Penn State University, uh, and so we ended up in the middle of Pennsylvania. That is where I uh, graduated high school and went to college. Wow. Yeah. So you're, I mean, you're among the pastures and the fields before you arrive at this massive school in the middle of nowhere, right? <laughs> it really is an oasis in the middle of nothing. One thing I, I was curious about with your upbringing is if sometimes you jump around a lot in schools, you're forced to have to create new friendships over and over and over again. And you know, do you feel like part of your development as an individual and your ability to communicate and relate and empathize, I mean, do you feel like that was part of that for you in your journey was creating these new relationships every time you guys moved? A thousand percent. I actually have said as hard as it is on kids to move like we did. And by the way, my siblings had it worse than me. The flexibility and adaptability and, you know, kind of my, when I say my ability to roll with the punches in my career, I think really I can attribute a lot of that to like, yeah, new situations, new people. You've just got to roll with it. It became a little bit innate at some point. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that makes sense. And so growing up with a dad in the military, yeah, what, what was it like growing up in that household? Is just very disciplined, strict? Was it like more creative? I mean- I'm going to hear a lot about my father on this podcast. I'm not going to lie to you. He's he's my North Star. He was a softy. And my mom, the CPA, chemistry teacher, you know, chemistry teacher, then a CPA, she was the disciplinary. She's the one I couldn't get away with anything on. Uh, my father uh, was, yeah, just a, a study in contrasts. L listen to Phantom of the Opera. If you got in his car, you'd, you'd hear quite a bit of um, Broadway, things of that nature. Awesome. Yeah, I love that. That's great. So you, you still got both sides, just counter to what you would have thought from the outside. A hundred percent. I tell people all the time, I'm like, my mom, don't cross her, but my dad, softy. Well, so, so it's so interesting because now at ClickUp, your uh, title is global head of people and places, right? So growing up in high school and state college, I mean- what, were you thinking, man, I can't wait to be head of people for a company one day? I mean, what was going through your head is like what you wanted to do directionally? A absolutely not. I actually had a long time where I wanted to be a meteorologist. Okay. Yeah. And when you're on the East Coast, you watch the weather all the time. I don't even watch the weather here. Uh, so I had this dream of becoming a meteorologist, but actually I tore my ACL playing football my senior year of high school. And uh, I fell in love with the physical therapy process to the point where I went to college and started as a biology major, but could not hack the chemistry. And I was like, oh, I'm not going to get into PT school, am I? And all of a sudden, just like probably everybody else, you stumble into your career. I went over to the College of Business, took on a management uh, major, and uh, eventually through the job I was doing, I had all these interests in the HR parts of my job, and I took on a human resources minor. You kind of rechart the pivots in your life. Uh, and that was an interesting one. And it, and it was coupled with a cousin of my best friend who was a corporate recruiter at a semiconductor company. He made the comment. I remember I was a junior in college. I was out visiting. 
And he's like, you should be a recruiter. You can make great money and it's a fun career. And you, you, you do well talking to people. Yeah. I've done a lot of the other like HR admin stuff, like scheduling and payroll and stuff like that. Through job, but the recruiting part, yeah, you I had to do that, but I was like, wait, there's a whole career where you just recruit for companies. So I came out of college, packed up the car, arrived the day after the Super Bowl in San Diego, the last Super Bowl in San Diego, found a recruiting agency, uh, recruiting traveling nurses, believe it or not. Yeah. Ultimately ended in a tech recruiting firm. Remember that same recruiter I referenced back when I met in college? He made an intro to a hiring director, uh, a recruiting director at Qualcomm, which at the time was the place to work in San Diego. And it's still the largest public company in San Diego by some some measure. And probably before I was even ready, I started my my kind of corporate life, non-agency recruitment life as a corporate recruiter. Wow. And then ServiceNow and then ClickUp. Yeah, it was it was my tech uh after ServiceNow where I let I led people. And then ServiceNow was an unbelievable four-year run. Uh, also a San Diego founded company and now ClickUp. And the big th- thread you can pull through all of that is I've tried very hard to stay in San Diego. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Got it. Okay. I found that to be a common trait in San Diegans. They like to to stay put if they can, right? So, so yeah. And my exposure to your current role has actually been as as an executive coach. We work um, with HR sometimes. They'll bring us in to to do leadership trainings, and uh, also a lot of my clients tend to be in the benefits industry on the benefits side. So, right, ADL, absence, life, disability, and I'm sure that you end up in that decision making process pretty often. I do. A leave of absences might be the most complicated thing in all of what I do. We have a lot of business owners that dial into this podcast of all sizes. Benefits, that's a big part of HR's job. It's a big differentiating factor when someone's looking for employment. And and so how do you, you know, what's your take on benefits? What's tended to matter more in this generation right now? Do you feel like since you work with so many people? Yeah, I I actually you hit it on that on the head there, Adam. I've actually said many times, like you know, people will start with focus on what do you pay, but ultimately, for most people at a certain stage of their life or their career, it's going to come back to what kind of benefits do you offer, and that's a real signal of the type of care and investment you make in your people. And and I will say that pendulum goes up, tilts towards as you go up in age, because generally people start having families and have more things to care for. Uh, on the newer grad side or the more junior side, that's aren't always as important just because they probably don't know the importance of having a great benefit program. So uh, the evolution I have seen here though, and the evolution I really want to be a part of building uh, at this company is this idea of choice. Um, so I talk about like different people have different needs uh, when it comes to benefits. And how do you create programs where people can actually select the things that mean the most to them? So if you're a family of four, uh, having a program where you know there's minimal co- employee contributions to cover your entire family, that's probably the most important thing to you. But if you're a young single person, you might index to things like professional development money or things of that nature. So how do you, and, and I, I haven't cracked the code on this, but how do you look at it holistically and say, we want to invest X in all of our employees kind of equally, but they have a menu they can choose from in terms of the benefits. It's really hard to operationalize, but I think that is where we're going to head. And I think especially with this this current generation that's coming out of school, professional development and personal development and even travel is like a very important thing to them. I don't see why we can't include that in benefits. Where we're at now is actually offering up programs that everyone can have a little more choice in terms of how they apply that benefit. Uh, so for instance, we just have a general wellness benefit for our employees. It, it's huge. It's $500 per year, but Adam, if you're a golfer, you could actually use that for a golf club. But if you're a yogi, you can use that for yoga classes. And we keep the definition of what wellness is pretty broad. And so our employees are able to choose what works for them. And so we're doing programs like that or professional development budget and things of that nature. And what I really do want to get to though, is that this idea that there's a certain amount we're going to invest in our employees from a benefits perspective, and they're going to have a way to actually almost spend that in a way that works best for them. Yeah. Okay. I love that. So zoom out for me for just a second, because we just went really deep on one side of your job. But if, if we talk about global head of people, for, for people that don't really know, what does that job even mean and look like? 
Every day it means something different. But let me let me start at the highest level, which is this thing I've said for a long time in terms of the seat I sit in is my job is to align the people strategy, the business strategy, right? And so how are we doing things that accelerate and support what we want to ultimately achieve from a business perspective? So when I talk about benefits, really, what are you trying to achieve there? You're trying to achieve care and feeding of your employees so you can retain them, right? So that's the business strategy is you want to retain good people. So that's why you spend time on benefits. But my job is so varied and probably the reason I gravitated to this every day can look very different. So uh, for, for instance, let's say today a senior leader gave notice. Yeah, My whole day is going to be figuring out how and when are we going to change manage this with the organization? Who are we letting know now? When are we messaging it? What's the message itself? Is this a good thing or a bad thing? Like, that would be my day and days probably. Uh, so there's an example of how it could go that way. You know, And of course, there's days where I'm just doing like the core aspects of the job. Like what's our strategy on our people technology, people systems? Are we attracting the right candidates? You know, there's core parts of the job. The toughest part of the job when you're letting people go, how do you do that in a really humane and beautiful way so that I mean, the reality in the situation is every company's going to have people who aren't a great fit. But I always say how you treat those people on the way out with the exception of that, like 0.5%, I can count on one hand. That's just like they deserve what is coming to them. 99.5% of people, those are people with a family, people who have a mortgage, people who have relationships and connections with your other employees. Treating them well and and humanely or beautifully, whatever you want to call it, is actually a really important consideration to my job. I spend time there too. So I'm saying a lot of words to say that I love my job because it's so varied. But the last piece I would say I spend most of my time on is making sure our executive team is aligned and we are all rowing in the same direction. Yeah. You're a bit of um, a consigliere, certainly to the CEO who's my boss, but just as much to your peers as well. To say, have you thought about this? You really do sit in a seat that change management is a big part of what you do. And sometimes you can offer a, a lot of advice there. Take it or leave it, right? I, I do view HR as like great legal counsel. Like, here's my counsel. Do what you want to do. You're still the business leader. Unless, of course, they're going to do something to get us in trouble. Yes. Right. But you know, you don't build a company, you, you build people and people build the business. And so the education that you infuse, having a plan and a program in place, I think it ends up being a, a critical part of how businesses keep and retain people and, and grow and develop those people into to being successful. Just regular conversations about career progression won't necessarily send your, your talent elsewhere um, that'll help you retain it. This is something that you talk about it sounds so simple because it is. It's human nature, right? Which is like people want to stay somewhere where they feel like they're being invested in and they're growing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so helping our managers understand that that's an important part of their job is something that we are always preaching here. And we've, we've operationalized it, right? So we have what we call quarterly growth conversations uh, so that we're you know, there's a mechanism that both employees and managers know these conversations should be happening. But yeah, I mean, it, it really does come down to people generally leave managers, right? Uh, and so how do you make sure that those managers are showing those people they're invested in their growth, they're invested in their development, and you'll hang on to people for longer. That's our goal. Yeah. Someone will come in, especially a young person will come and join your company. Maybe they're you're not as competitive on the dollar rate today but they can see a pathway to leadership, a pathway to more responsibility, and that can override competitive pay, right? And actually, the other thing that we preach to managers is find out what motivates your employees, right? So you might have an employee who you know is independently wealthy, but chooses to work anyway. They might not care about the money. They might just care about the promotion or that they're learning a new thing. Or so. so really personalizing it and individualizing leadership, that's an important thing we preach as well. Yeah, understand your people and what what makes them tick. That's huge. Something you said earlier that I feel like you'd have some perspective on as well, and you could speak to this more is the age of quiet quitting and what that means. Can I tell you my? This isn't a hot take. I think I've heard a bunch of people say this, but they used to call quiet quitting resting and investing, right? Which to me is pretty much the same thing. Which is you've got an employee who's disengaged. Why are they disengaged? Probably because you're not invested in their growth and development. <laughs> Right. Or perhaps it's that your work environment is not one that, you know, is resonating with that particular individual. And so for me, it's like, look, if you've got someone who's quiet quitting, it should be pretty easy to figure out why that is. Right. So if you're sensing an employee is withdrawn and maybe not giving the effort that they used to, because at some point, almost every employee is joining an organization and is giving their all. But if you sense that, 
have those interviews. We call them, you know, stay interviews. I'm sure you've heard the book Love Them or Lose Them. No. You know, one of the core things in that book is like this idea of a stay interview, uh, which is what, what do we need to do to keep you here? How are you motivated? You know, where do you want to grow? Kind of going back to the conversation we were having before. And I think yeah. if you're having those types of conversations, you're going to avoid a lot of quiet quitting. Simple, but great advice. And I think, you know, something I'm, I'm hearing that might be a principle of yours is having an investigative attitude. I mean, I feel like every time we've talked about something in this interview, you've come back to ask better questions of your employees, uh, know them better, be curious. I mean, it seems to be a general theme. Did you just drop a Ted Lasso reference? <laughs> it's, it's all in my head now. It's just baked in after watching the episode. So maybe. The Be Curious episode. And by the way, Ted Lasso is a show about leadership and how to treat people. It's not a show about football or soccer or whatever you want to call it. But yeah, I mean, yes, ultimately, and and you know, I have a team I lead too, right? Ultimately, it comes down to like asking the right questions, understanding people's motivations, and trying to align their wants and needs with what you need in your business. That's not always possible, by the way. So some of the harder conversations I've probably had in my career are this probably isn't the place you want to be then, right? Because I don't, I, I don't know that I can give you what you're looking for. Yeah. But, you know, being investigative, like you said, um, and asking the questions and really understanding your people, that's core to leadership. Now, be curious. Again, I could watch, I'm going to go watch that scene right after this because it is just a brilliant, brilliant scene. Yeah. It's amazing how those things get stuck in your head after watching TV. Um, right now, you oversee roughly about a thousand or so employees, right? There's got to be some of the challenges that you faced growing into this position personally. You know what would have been some of those those pivot points for you? Yeah, I'll I'll start with like the transition into management, which I think is going to resonate with almost everybody. It's this idea that you need to empower others to get things done rather than doing them yourself is actually a really hard transition, especially for high achievers, right? So you know, I, I think back to that inflection point and the stumbles I had there. Staying out of people's way, helping helping where they need help, but staying out of their way and, and granting autonomy. Like that was a bumpy time. Like, you know, you I, I think leadership is innate to some people and that transition happens quicker. But anybody who is a a great performer heading into management, that's a tougher transition than probably we remember. Uh-huh. The biggest transition for me, and, and going back to your question, um, you know, when I left ServiceNow, there was about eleven thousand employees in the organizations I had a remit on. It was an enormous job with so many stakeholders and things like that. And you get imposter syndrome, which I'm sure a lot of people talk about uh, on this podcast. It's a it's a real thing. It's like, do I belong at this level? These people are brilliant. You ask yourself those questions and it takes time to grow past that. What I think my biggest learning there was was this idea of, I don't have to know it. Like I I remember, you know, making a conscious decision to saying in front of the the COO president, like, you know, I don't know that answer. Let me get back to you. Let me talk to my team and get you a good answer. Right. Whereas probably earlier in my career, I would have been like stumbling over my words, but like having confidence and not knowing everything as a leader who has such a broad remit. And now with our thousand employees where I am now, like there are plenty of times where I don't have the answer for my CEO. And it's like, Hey, let me get, get back to you with a, a really good answer. Uh, but in, in a, in the same way, I do feel like I also learned how to know enough to be dangerous in all the areas I oversaw. So it was this idea of going a mile wide, uh, and an inch deep became a really important part of my job as well. Um, and how I spent my time and where I spent my time, uh, helped me. But I will tell you for, for some amount of time going into that job every day, I was like, this is so much. And again, coming back to the imposter thing, it's like, no one else in this role probably feels that way. Like they're uh, no, nope. but then you talk to them. Like the the nice part about our job, Adam, is we talk to leaders and like the people who you would think have zero doubts about themselves, just yeah. zero doubts. Right? They're the most self assured person in a meeting. They're always saying brilliant things. They have those same insecurities and and doubts. And if they don't, they're probably narcissists and stay away. Yeah, understood. No, I I think that's really and the, what you said as well about knowing just enough information to be able to communicate with that department within a department, right? Like you need to know enough to speak the language. Uh, you're not expected to go super deep and be the expert on everything because it's, it's impossible. Well, that's why you have an organization, right? Because there are subject matter experts that know everything. And yeah, you've got to be knowledgeable enough to have an opinion or say, Hey, I don't know. So anyway, I, that's a, a long winded learning, but it, it has truly been my biggest leadership learning. That's great. You know what? 
in, in this pathway, I guess, what, what would you give 21 year old, what, what kind of advice, Jim, would you provide yourself around that age now having made this journey? You know, part of me wants to say you are who you are because you acted the way you did. But if I had to go back there, honestly, it would, it would, it would truly be adopting some of my father's life lessons earlier. Uh, I think I referenced earlier, you know, he passed away about five years ago and he always had this dis- decision-making framework he placed on everything, which is it ended with, is it the right thing to do? Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I felt like that has served me so well in my career. Now that I've just adopted it, it's like, we have a lot of legal and compliance and so many things in my job where it's like, God, you can, you can paralyze yourself with, oh, are we going to get in trouble? But then I apply the simple lens of, especially when it comes to the people we deal with, is it the right thing to do? And that usually solves all problems. And I think 21-year-old Jim uh, should have heard that message earlier um, because it allows you to operate with probably a better compass. It's great. I heard it from him all those years, but I probably didn't internalize it until I got a little older. That's right. Well, and it was probably also on an episode of Ted Lasso, and we don't even know. That had a little Ted Lasso in him. (laughs) It did have a little Ted Lasso in him. So yeah, I, I think that's so good. And I, I think we overcomplicate decisions sometimes and something that's a simple filter, which is, yeah, is it the right thing can take a lot of the complexity out and make it what it should be, which is a simple, a simple decision, even if it's one that hurts a little bit in the short term. 100%. Yep. Yeah. This is really great conversation. I guess uh, kind of quick lightning round questions that we like to ask. Any like functional app that you've used on your phone lately that's been helpful for you or others? I mean, does it have to be on my phone? I mean, I, I truly have div- dove into Bard and GPT. I, I use them quite frequently. They are incredible productivity tools. Uh, and I think as long as we continue to remind ourselves that the outputs of those things are imperfect and it needs a human to make it good, uh, they are great things for us and for our teams. You hear GPT all the time, but I'm actually really impressed with Bard. It's really good from like an answering question perspective. And, and for listeners, Bard is... Yeah, Google's large language model, better in some ways, different in some ways. You know, uh, for answers, I go to Bard. Uh, and I think that's no surprise given that Google's been indexing the world's information for 20 plus years, right? Uh, for creativity, which is actually a big part of my job and a starting point on how to frame a message, uh, I enjoy GPT. Okay. But here's another quick one. In, take a minute if you need to, to think about this, but define what success means to you because everybody has a little bit of a different definition of what a successful life means or what success means in general. Um, how do you know when you've achieved it? Success for me is to be respected. My job is one where I am sometimes, sometimes having to make decisions that are going to be unpopular, but am I doing them fairly and consistently? And, you know, again, kind of putting the human first and asking the, is it the right thing to do question? If people can at least respect my decisions, then I'm okay with them not agreeing with them, right? It's incredibly difficult for many of us to change the our intake of that and say, okay, I'm okay if I'm not liked by everybody because no one can be, right? But you can earn people's respect, right? And and being respected versus always being liked is probably a little bit more of an effective way of showing up. And especially if you're a strengths finder person, as I am, I have woo uh, in there. So it's hard for me not to be liked, but I have finally gotten to the point where it's like to be respected is is better than liked. Although I want to be liked too. I'm not going to lie. Everybody does. Yeah. I think to a degree, most people do, but yeah, but that's a great, that's a great definition for success. So one habit or practice that saves you the most time each day. I, I block my calendar to do actual work. And eat, by the way, because I, I really do need to recharge, but uh, I actually block my calendar conscientiously to make sure that I have space and time to give thoughtful replies to people, not three-letter thanks, right? Uh, that's been a, a big thing for me, uh, or I always feel like I'm behind. And you literally block it so the assistant or someone can't look at your outlook and go, oh, I'm just going to squeeze this in there. Well, they know that that's a really important time for me. So I have an hour uh, that says focus every day. And unless there's a really big, you know, an executive leaving, coming back to that, like unless there's a fire drill, I'm going to get that time and I'm going to use it to hopefully uh, get back to people too. And I do think it's important as a leader to be available and responsive. And I pride myself on that. Absolutely. But I think there's value also 
be able to close your door for a minute and and be able to focus. So that's good. This has been great, Jim. Any direction you want to send people? Actually, they should come to the ClickUp website. I think people would be surprised that no matter what business you are in, uh, how big or small your company is, ClickUp is an incredibly powerful tool to unlock productivity. That's what we do. Well, thanks for joining us, Jim. This has been great. This has been awesome. Thank you so much for having me. If you enjoy this podcast, please make sure to subscribe. And to stay updated on everything that the Action Catalyst is up to, make sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Action Catalyst Podcast and on Twitter at Catalyst underscore Action. And thanks for listening.